we have been looking at the last days deception the last days deception are some of the peculiar ways that the devil will try to deceive people at the end i've talked about the end i've talked about given you talk to you about dates and times i've talked about seasons the lord jesus was once talking with the pharisees and others and he was quite irritated with them it's obvious the reason for his irritation was that they knew how to tell the signs of the times regarding natural things they knew how to say ah look at this ah look at this sign and they were very good at reading the signs about natural things look at matthew 16 the lord jesus says from verse 1 the pharisees and sadducees came up and testing jesus they asked him to show them a sign from heaven they asked him to show them a sign from heaven show us a sign from heaven they're testing him oh yeah prove something to us but he replied to them when it is evening you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red so they could look at the color of the sky and say mm, the weather is going to be fair that's going to be there okay weather it won't be stormy it won't be tumultuous it's just going to be there based on you know you can see aha the sky tells you and in the morning there will be a storm today for the sky is red and threatening so they look at the sky sometimes and they go uh from what i see it's it's gonna be a storm do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky but cannot discern the signs of the times this was the question jesus had for them now there are many people that delight in saying nobody can know anything we've pointed out from first thessalonians 5 that you're meant to know that the day of the lord ought not to come on the children of god as a thief in the night that we've proven clearly not just with first thessalonians 5 with other scriptures like it was in the days of noah like it was in the days of lot we've shown you that those two people that jesus gave us as examples of how it will be in the last day they knew both of them knew no one knew seven days to the exact event lots knew the night before and the next day by the time he left the sun was high in the sky so it was about noon let's say those angels opened up to him about eight o'clock or nine o'clock he had at least look at the time he had at least nine hours So he knew. He wasn't taken by surprise. And we saw in Second uh, Peter 2 how he says that the Lord is able to rescue the righteous from trouble. So we've seen that one of the ways he rescues them is simply by going to bring them out. He tells them and brings them out. Simple. It's not complicated. You know? So the Lord knows how to deliver the righteous from trouble. And to preserve the wicked for punishment. And the things that are, have been, Ecclesiastes 1. You can tell what will be sometimes from what has been. There may be some variations, but the general idea is there. The general idea is, is obvious. So you are meant to know the signs of the times. The book of Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13. All those, they are synoptic, you know, you know, similar. 
They tell you of the things to look out for. The Lord, they asked Jesus, Lord, how will we know when the time comes and all that? And he sat down and told them. He said, you look out for this. This will happen and this will happen and this will happen. So he gave us signs. If you're blundering along in life, attending some church where nothing is ever said about the signs, and there are people that keep using the basic signs, oh, wars, troubles, earthquakes. There have always been wars and troubles and earthquakes. I'm sorry, that's not a sign of the end of the times. The Lord Jesus gave a list of troubles and wars, and he said, but the end will not yet be. So you have to be a bit more attentive than that. You can't just be careless. Ah, there's trouble. In fact, it was so bad that I think by 2 Peter 3, Peter said by the Holy Spirit, he said, Men, people will say, things have remained the same from the time of the fathers. People are always saying the Lord is coming. And he said, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. And then he now went on to give the Christians a sign. He said, know this one thing, that a thousand years with the Lord is as a day. He gave them a key. You know, oh, these mistakes you guys making, knowing things. Hey, let me give you a key from the book of Psalm 90. A thousand years is as a day with the Lord, and a day as a thousand years. That was a key he gave them. Remember, Jesus has said to Peter, I give you the keys of heaven. Of the kingdom of God. I give you the keys of the kingdom. That you might open things. And that you might shut things. So he gave, Peter gave us a key. And we, we put in diagrammatic form here. From Adam to the season we are in today. Today is a nebulous term. It refers to this whole season. This time, you know, in the time of the book of Hebrews, he said, today, if you hear his voice, I believe chapter 7, harden not your heart. And that was back then, close to after the resurrection of Jesus. He said, today, he referred to that time as today. Harden not your heart. Why? Because they had entered the season of grace. You read the book of Hebrews. It was a season of grace and he was telling them how the children of Israel had an opportunity to enter the promised land. And they didn't believe. You know the story. And in the book of Numbers, I believe chapter 14, the Lord went like, ah, you know what? You guys won't enter. Go back. You won't enter anymore. I won't let you enter. And they went and roamed around, completed 38 more years to make 40 years. And that generation died away. And now, under the Holy Spirit, the writer of the book of Hebrews says, Today, again, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart how they did at that time. Why? Because when you get to your todays and you harden your heart, you are sent back to roam around and perish. Many, many individuals have come to their todays and have hardened their hearts in their todays. Todays are open doors. That's what a today of scripture is. It's an open door. It's when you come to a time of opportunity and access given by God and you disdain it. You disdain it. You despise it. It's an open door. That's what a today is. The children of Israel had at Kadesh Barnea, they had a today moment. The door was open. God said, go in, take the land. They sent out spies. The spies came back and said, today is not the day. And they believed the report of the spies above the report of the servant of God, Moses. The report that God, of Joshua and Caleb, who were in line with Moses and Aaron. The things God had said. And therefore, that door closed on them. This is a real thing. I repeat, it happens to individuals. It happens to groups. It happens to nations. God tells nations today. Ah, he tells Indonesia in the late 40s, 50s. Today, miracles, signs and wonders, every kind of amazing thing happens in Indonesia. Today, Indonesia is the most populated Muslim country on earth. People were walking on water in groups. 
walking in rain, dry, multiplying food, changing water to wine. Kurt Kurt, a German man, said in the time he went and visited them during that revival, he saw water change to wine six times in the church group he joined. They'll fetch ordinary water and pour in and it'll be wine, red wine. And he saw it with his eyes six times. And it was normal because they had no wine there. They were too poor. They couldn't afford to import wine. All these things are to make the point that Indonesia had a today moment. Amazing. God spoke to me about this in 2004. While I was waiting on the Lord, December 2004. And uh, he, he spoke to me. I was cut off. I was fasting and praying. You know, the lodge where I was staying as a core member at the time. There was nobody there again. People had gone home. So I, I didn't know what was happening. Spoke to me about Indonesia. Spoke to me. Showed me. In the, I saw Indonesia on the map at the back of my diary. And then from the scriptures about the waters and the tossing of the waves and the nations being afraid. I wondered, what does this mean? I forgot about it. And I was also reading a book called The Revival in, in Indonesia. Then I came out, traveled back to my parents' house at the time in January. As I was entering, I heard on the radio, the tsunami in Indonesia, you know, now you see when things come together like that. So I had been locked up in a room, fasting and praying, no news, nothing. I knew nothing of what was happening in society. I was alone. And God pointed out Indonesia. I remember seeing it on the map, the back of my, at my diary, the atlas. You know? And I go like, wow, so this is how Indonesia is. Mm, it's a group of many islands, you know, it's in water. Huh. I remember just noting that. And I forgot it. But that's a place where they kill Christians, burn churches, and just do many, many mean things. If you look at Hebrews 3, 7, Hebrews 3, 7, the passage I mentioned, I said 7, chapter 7, I made a mistake there. You know, it's 3, 7. It says, Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they did not know my ways. Where do they go astray? In their hearts, is in their heart. That's where all change happens here first. They go astray in their hearts. And he didn't say they once went astray or twice. They always, that is, they had a habit of missing it at the heart level. And they do not know my ways. They didn't know God's ways. If you want to line up with God and not go astray in your heart, learn his ways. What does he like? What does he do? What does he choose? How does he operate? Look at the Bible. Look at how he relates. Look at how he responds. Look at how he reacts. Look at his instructions. Then you can know his ways. Look at how he relates to people. Look at what people do and it pleases him. Look at what they do and it offends him. Look at the kind of people he commends. Hebrews 11. Look at the people he disapproves, he rebukes. Look, you must want to know how a person is. A wise person learns the ways of God. You know what the things that offend leaders, maybe a boss in an office, an official, is when you don't learn to know their ways. Every event is an event for you. Every matter, they have to start from scratch and say, hey, this is A. One line, one line, and a line in between. You are not learning the person's ways. When you know a person's ways, you, you know how they think without their telling you. Are you understanding? This is the difference between knowing his acts. Oh, this is what my boss said. This is what my father said. A wise person gets to know the ways of the father. A wise person gets to know the ways of the leader. A wise person gets to know the ways of his God. It's not every time God has a God speak to me. What did he say the last four times this kind of thing happened? Why are you asking him again? Haven't you learned his ways his nature, his inclinations. What does God like? What did you do the other time and he liked it? 
Uh-huh. Ah, don't go to that girl's house. You remember how you got up to go? I gave you a dream that morning. As we were going out, someone saw you and said, I saw you today entering trouble. I saw you. You went somewhere you shouldn't go and you got into trouble. And you had planned to go somewhere. You know his ways. I told you how I was going as a student in the university. I had left the class, about to go to my hostel. This was past 9 or to 10 at night. I had been reading in the class. I'm about to go to a hostel and sleep. And as I step out of the faculty of law where I, I was, you know, I had the option of going left towards M2, the University of U hostel, or towards the right. Now, of course, I was going left. But there was this strong pull. I remember, I think it was one of those things where I actually physically went like, ah! And then I yielded. I knew the Holy Spirit was dragging me. Go right. And I go right. And I go to the hostel and I ask someone, please, can you go to room, uh, whatever the person was in, and uh, call them for me. Tell them it ties outside. And the person comes out and says, ah, thank God you came. I was praying that you would come. Like she was actually on her knees, disturbing my life. <laughs> you know, and she said, thank God you came. If you didn't come, hmm, I would have done something tomorrow that would have been very bad, literally. So things can happen. Now, let's say that young lady, another time is tempted to do whatever it is she was thinking of doing. I don't think I asked her. I used to be very, <laughs> if it's now, ask you, what if I did? Then, <laughs> why do I need to know? No need to know many things. It's to dodge information so much. And I remember, you know, so I'm, I'm saying, picture that another time she thinks of going, maybe to a man's house to look for money or something. Picture if she disobeyed another time and says, uh, God, I asked you now, I asked you if you don't want me to go, send somebody. Come on. It's called tempting the Lord your God. It's called hardening your heart. You know his ways. You know he doesn't want you to go. You know what he said the other time. You know what the scriptures say. You know what you read in the Bible. You know what you heard shared during morning devotions. You know. You, you know it from different things. You know it from that dream, from that vision. You know it. You get to know a person. Look at, I am a father. So let's say one of my kids, my children, you know, knows that I like cold water or whatever. I don't like tepid water, water that is not at least a bit cool, you know, just ordinary water, you know. And I'm about to go for a meeting or I'm sitting in my study and I say, get me some water. And he just turns around and, and grabs a, a bottle of uh, that some of the bottles of water that couldn't fit into the fridge that just have been there. And he gives it to me instead of uh, getting, pulling one from the fridge and, and pouring into my flask for me to drink. So he gives me and I go, you know, and I go, this is an actual look that has come on my face after drinking water uh, once or twice. But it was a circumstance that couldn't be helped. You know? I think he was here in the meeting and the, the uh, water dispenser, they had just put in water. It wasn't cold. It wasn't working. And I went like, ah, horrible. If the child has been paying attention, you know my ways. You know, you know I like a certain kind of water. If he do, just pours anything inside, it means he hasn't learned my ways. Doesn't care. That's what it means to know your father's ways. To know a person's ways. You know what they like. You know what they say. Don't do. You, the last three times you did it, they frowned. You, the first time they had a look on their face. The second time they said, um, don't be doing this. The third time they said, I've told you not to be doing this. You do it the fifth time, the tenth time. What are you doing? You're like, I don't care about your ways. I'll do it my way. You're not studying his ways. Every time a people do not, the Bible says of Moses, it says the children of Israel, they knew the acts of God, the actions. Moses knew his ways. Wise people get to know the ways of God. You know people's ways by paying attention, by listening for their heart, by asking questions. Okay, would you? I noticed that the last two times 
Is it that you, oh, okay, I, I guessed. I just wanted to be sure. And you know their way. But those who don't care about God's ways, you don't give a hoot. You, you just do anything you like. No, again, and it's common in the body of Christ now. Why? Because you've been taught that God exists to serve you, like he's your servant. He exists for you to make demands and he complies with you. Instead of you being his servant, we act like God is our servant and he exists to serve us. And that's wrong. So what did happen? As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And then he says in verse 12, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. He calls it an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away. Remember, he had said earlier on that they hardened their hearts when they provoked him. Every time you harden your heart and act like you didn't hear before, you didn't notice before, every time you act as though Something has never happened. You remember when he spoke to them in the book of Numbers? I believe it's chapter 11. He said, these 10 times have you tested me? You've tried me. He gave them a count. said 10 times. That's an obvious sign of a hardened heart. Repeated error. Repeated lack of. Remorse. That is how you know a hardened heart. Why are you doing the same thing? Why are you doing, why are you saying the same thing? Why are you repeating? Didn't you hear the last time what was said? So you're hardening your heart. Jesus said this to his own disciples. They said, he said, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. And they said to each other, it's because I don't know who turned to one said it. Maybe James said to John or Thomas. The people that were involved in that bread matter the other time, I think it was Philip. Philip and Andrew, it probably them. You know, maybe they're the ones that were more, they took care of food matters, you know. And he goes, uh, he said, he should be worthy the yeast. You know, we forgot. Do you bring bread? You guys forgot to bring bread. Ah, you see now, that's what the master is complaining about. That's why Jesus went like, chai, unadolu, chai, chai, chai. He was irritated. The Bible says he was irritated. And he said to them, the Bible says their hearts were hardened, and he said to them, more or less, let me paraphrase, what are you talking about lack of food, bread for? Have you forgotten the miracle of the five loaves where you took up extra 12 baskets and of the seven loaves, when you took up seven baskets extra, after we shared it to thousands of people, how can it be bread I am talking about? And the Bible says they are hard to handle. So what has happened is, they are not observing. They think upside down. Nobody that had been around Jesus should be discussing lack of food. Because he had proven to them that we can handle food, we can multiply it if need be, don't worry. Is no matter. But a hardened heart does not take note of matters when it is stated. A hardened heart seems to lack the ability to hear and see and observe the reality around them. You go to a church group. You join a group, a, a fellowship somewhere. Your life is transformed. Your life is transformed. Every time you're with that group of people, you love God more. You're on fire. You're burning. And then you find it easy to be pulling away from that group and saying, oh, I'm, I'm looking for God. I'm just looking for a place where my heart can get to know God. Your heart is hardened. You're not observing the ways of God, the reality. You notice you had a certain friend in uh, primary, secondary school or university, first year. While you were close to this friend, you were well-behaved. You, your friend acts like a second conscience, helps you. You, you love God, you study well, you, 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 things are good in, in your heart, in your conscience. You're at peace with God. Then you have this other friend, whenever you're close to them, you miss the way, you go bad. And then you say, I'm, I'm, 
trying to know which of my friends to go with. Are you serious? Your heart is hardened. You, 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 and if you continue, and this is the warning, God is saying, make sure you don't harden your heart. A hard heart ignores the facts. A hard heart ignores the truth, ignores the obvious, and is looking for what is not missing. The disciples should have known. Jesus cannot be talking about bread. He has no fear of a lack of food. He can create food. So that's not the problem. Hardened hearts, it's not that they look at Jesus and say, what is it? They are not challenging him. They are just ignoring what he has done and said so far. That's how hardened hearts work. It, they, it, ignores, it ignores what has been. It acts as if we are always starting from the drawing board, as though you're just beginning afresh. As though it acts like, eh, oh, I've never known that before. Oh, is it so? That's how a hardened heart works. May you not have a hardened heart. Yeah. It displeases the Lord. I like to use the example of his apostles so that you don't say, oh, it's for very extremely wicked people. No. It is not just extremely wicked people. You know, it is also people who they are, who have, uh, you know, let's say their hearts are good. You know, they care about God. They love the Lord. You can't tell, say that the ap apostles were, were, you know, had a bad mind, but they were confused. Okay? Let me show it to you just so you have it down. Mark chapter, the book of Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. I'll read some other parts, but let me just bring out this part. Okay, so Mark chapter 8, verse 14, 14 to 21. So just for you, I've already paraphrased it, but now the disciples had forgotten to take bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. See, that one loaf was enough. That's all Jesus needed. He just needs a little cooperation on your part. A little faith, like a mustard seed, something from you. Just bring it to me. There's a song. What's that you have in your hands? I can use it. I can't, I can't remember who sang it. If you're willing to lose it, take the little you have and make it grand. I am El Shaddai, and I'll more than supply your need. Bring one loaf, bring five loaves. I'll feed 5,000, not counting women and children. In all those stories, someone had something. It's the same story. Bring something. What do you have? A little faith. Will you carry your body? God, I know. You know, I was reading uh, a sister's uh, testimony, Ibim's testimony today. You know, because we want to print it. I was just scanning through uh, editing because we want to print it as a tract. And uh, I was, so I was seeing the story again and I was calling her to ask for clarity on some things she said. You know, but I'm remembering the place where she said, so in her second year, that was the first time she saw me. I was invited to the faculty fellowship to preach. And uh, she, she said the meeting was very powerful. She felt transformed the Holy Spirit. She prayed very powerfully. And yes, it was a one of them was my first meeting. I saw the Holy Spirit show up like that, that strongly. And all of that. So, she was there. That was her second year as a student. And then, sorry, this part is not in the testimony. So, it's not in what she said or in the written testimony. But she mentions a part where I, I saw her, she walked past. She walked past, you know, it was revised, some things were added. 
I think as I was driving to my house, I saw her passing and I went like, ah, that's, I've seen that girl. I used to go back, aha, on Fridays after that meeting for about three Fridays or so, three or four, and hold classes in the evenings with, with them. In another hall somewhere there in the university the moot court and uh, that was it after that holidays came December and that was the end and I remember I can't remember when but sometime maybe uh, 2 15 and I see her pass the front of my gate and I go like hey what's your name again oh do you stay around here? And it turns out she was staying not far away. And I was like, wow, you stay around here? Ah, uh -huh, come, come by, come and visit. And she came and visited. Sat in my parlor and I, I asked her questions, talked to her, showed her things in the Bible. I had some visitors come. She was there while we were talking and they left later and all that. But in her testimony, you hear her say she, she came but she was afraid because she has heard stories of men of God molesting her and she didn't come again. The one she should add, you know, I wish I could make her add it, you know. And also you had demons, so, you know, you won't come around. What is this? Because what did you see that made you not come again? When that one time you came, what, what did you see? You, you were running from Bible. I, I had told her, I remember when she was there, I made her read a portion of the Bible while she was waiting. God was with visitors and I told her she should read. So I guess her flesh was afraid of the way I see this man. If you hang around this man, you read Bible day and night, you know. So she ran away, created, you know, a demon told her a lie. She, 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 she stayed away. Now, why is it important? Because you hear her say, you hear her say that the next time when she thinks she got born again officially, was in her final year. That was her second year. This was her second year. And then she was living like a pure sinner. So she came in contact with me that one. Oh, she felt the presence of God. I was like, oh, wow. And she kept coming for those Bible studies once, twice, thrice. And because they stopped holding, that was the end of her Christian life. That was it. She lived in sin with her many boyfriends. Thereafter, till final year. You know, but in between, this is what I want to say. What was the loaf of bread she had? What did she have? The little she had then. Oh, I, this man was a blessing to me. And she came when I was going to their meetings. Was what she had. And God was taking that and doing something with it. When she stopped giving her attention, when God made me see her. But she refused. I told her, I'd be coming back. Come by, maybe on Saturdays or something. Come by. I mean, it's a family house. You know, my wife is there. My children are there. Other people come around. You know. The church was not meeting. God said, we were not meeting. I had post-pastoring at the time. But Amaka used to come by. Anne used to come by. Margaret used to come by. Even if it's once in a semester or twice. But they came by. She never came by. So she didn't bring anything. Are you understanding me? She didn't bring a loaf. She brought nothing. What's special? Her time, her attention. She didn't bring anything. If she had brought it, the spirit of the Lord on me would have multiplied it like he was multiplying in the meantime in the lives of the others that would bring what they had. When you bring what you have, that's all the Lord needs. You know, people are always telling stories about, I wish God would do this in my life. You know, when God told me in the, for those that have been here, you know the phrase, keep coming. That's what God told me because I was wondering what to do. All the challenges people were struggling with and saying this and that. And I asked God, what, how do we handle these challenges? These people want to follow you, but they're stumbling, they're struggling. And he said, tell them to keep coming. That's all. You can't, you can't transform people instantly. Let them just keep coming. That is, that's their job. That's the loaf of bread that they were to make available. That's the five loaves. Just free your time at this time. Carry your body and come to this meeting place and sit down. That's all. 
And everyone that did that, at least we've had years now to observe, everyone that did that was transformed. Everyone that couldn't do that, some of them came years later and started doing it. That's when the transformation began. There's some, they came together in first year and stayed away. The ones that stayed kept growing. The ones that couldn't stay, wouldn't stay, didn't stay, refused to give their bread. That was it. And it, I mean, there are many such, it happened a lot. I had people come, one walks in, you know, and uh, because they won't hand over that one loaf to Jesus, don't be bothering about, oh, I don't have enough. God never expects you to have enough. You can't have enough. By flesh shall no man prevail. God knows you don't have enough. All he wants you to have is something. Anything. Like a mustard seed. You know how they say faith like a mustard seed. You guys, when you hear that, you think in your heart. Oh, faith in my heart. Yes. In your heart. But faith without works is dead. So in your heart as shown in your actions. How you show your faith. Abraham believed in God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. But how did he show it? He showed it by offering his son as a sacrifice. He said, your son, your only son, that's what he had. That's his one loaf. Give the one you have. Do the one thing you can do. I know temptation. I know the devil. I know this life. I know your flesh is weak. I know all of that. But are you doing the one you can do? Do the one you can do. Give him that thing. What can you Can you kneel down by your bed? As you're about to stand up, you're feeling that struggle and you're feeling you should pray. Just kneel down, talk to God. Say, no, uh, let me go and hustle. Can you kneel down for two minutes? Well, I guess I can. Then do it. Kneel down and then say, Lord, concerning this challenge. Uh, that's what you can do. You can't change the circumstance, but you can talk to God. You can lay your complaint before God. Just do it. That's your one loaf. That's your mustard seed. Is this clear? All right, so there are people here hearing me. And this has been your issue. And it's the same thing. I'm not saying anything new. But I'm coming from another angle. God doesn't need 50 loaves. 5,000 loaves for 5,000 men. He needs five. He needs whatever is in the young boy's basket. If it had been one loaf, it would have been enough. Why? Look at the extra that remained. After everyone ate and was full. They ate till they were full. There were baskets full of bread left. At the beginning, there wasn't even up to one basket full of bread. At the end, there were multiple baskets. After maybe 10,000 people have eaten. That's Jesus for you. And that's what anybody, you see servants of God, you see men of God, you see a person like me. And you wonder, oh, look at he tries or how... Every true servant of God will tell you the truth. You hear them say it one way or the other. Even they stand and wonder how did this happen. The secret is just keep coming. Just give him what you have. What do you have? Give it. Obey that one. Stop thinking far. Stop thinking far. I keep seeing people. You, you're a busy body in the spirit. You think too far and it's why you fall. It's to him who is able to keep you from falling. There is the one who is able to supply all your need. Don't be a busy body. It's called unbelief. It's called a lack of faith. It's called a hardening of the heart. Look back and see the things God has done in you. How did he do it? You were so muscular in the spirit. You fasted 21 days. When you got up, that's not what happened. What happened is that you... Your friend said, come, let's go for that meeting. And you said, oh, I feel like resting. Come, let's go now. And you went for that meeting and your life has never been the same. In that Sister Ibim story, she said, she heard in her final year, oh, that I was holding a, she, uh, a, a, an overnight meeting, a, what we call a tarry. And she came and she said, I knew that when I go, something, that was her one loaf of bread. She said, I knew when I go, something would change. And something changed. And she had... At first, I, I was, I didn't remember that or know it, you know. But she said, oh, when he laid hands on me, I had my first vision. And she was shocked. How can God show someone so bad? 
today, this today, today, I was with my boyfriend doing things I shouldn't do. How can God touch me so powerfully and show me a vision? Because he's a good God. He's a kind God. And her life was never the same. She gave that one loaf of bread and God took that. And from that day till now, she has not had a boyfriend. From that day till now, she has not misbehaved like that. From that day till now, five years ago, from that day, because she gave that one thing. And some people will be busy saying, I pray God will change me. I'll continue doing what I'm doing. I won't hand over my one loaf, but I pray. Ah, I'm trusting God. He will change me. Change you how? Bring your mustard seed. Step out. You must give him something to work with. You must give God something to work with. Wise people, hear me. Give God something to work with. God always wants something. He demands of you a loaf. Five loaves. Mustard seed. Faith. Not just in your heart, in actions. Do something. Then watch him blow on it. What did I do? All I did was obey God. I told them, hey, you guys, please. You know those Bible studies we were having in 214? That time that we stopped. Uh -huh. Please, can you guys come again? Uh, come. Tell the other person to come. And two of them came. Amaka and Anne. They came. That was all. And then later on, I asked, there was the other girl, Margaret. You know, and then she came with Abbasiani. They came. They always came on separate days. I would have to do the same Bible study twice a week. This one will come on Tuesday. I said they saw you people are going. We are not coming. Then on Thursday, these two will come. And then the next Tuesday, these two. That's why when they try to complain today, I tell them, hey, Metron and Bo did there. You think I've forgotten what you people used to do to me? A grown up man like me. They didn't even have fear. I mean, this is a, a lawyer. You're a law student. You don't even have fear. You don't have fear. Still so say, sir, barrister, sir. You have the audacity to keep me. I'll be sitting and waiting for them. They arrive 30 minutes, one hour late. They just come in, two of them looking like. They will make sure they never come at the same time. So the same class I taught on Tuesday, I'll teach you again on Thursday. It's not now. You guys come. Everything is organized. I suffered in these people's hand. I hope they are listening. <laughs> they had been trained through rougher things. <laughs> far worse situations. So that was happy. I mean, I was in my parlor. It's not the one I used to drive down far, far out of outskirts to Domita Farm and sit down. And you see someone, the person you're waiting for, whom you called in the morning, you spoke to last week, you spoke to that evening, you spoke to, and you see them, see the, that barand, that porch where we hold tarry sometimes, and you see the person can pass with vegetable leaves. <laughs> Good evening, sir. He had been sleeping and watching movies from 9 a.m. in the morning. I came from my office with a tie, hungry, walking all day, drove down, bad road, and you get there. You see someone passing with a bucket and a towel. Good evening, sir. And they do it this week, next week, the next week, the next week, the next week, the next week. And you cannot believe it. Everything you go, it's like, what's the use of, what? Why this insult? What is this? God, why? What did I do? Why, why do I have to come here? For what purpose? Who sent me? Who is, am I trying to build anything? Nothing. Am I trying to get members? Nothing. It's not even that situation where you're trying to get members. Zero. <laughs> so I had been trained by these brutal trainers. So sitting in my parlor, waiting for small children to show up was nah, it's soft chair. I can be reading my Bible, looking at ah, uh, this is enjoyment now. Huh? That's why sometimes God puts you through very rough circumstances. Don't complain. You know when you've been through a jungle and you're now going through a bush. A bush is a joke because you've been in the jungle. You understand? That's how it works. God pushes us to the limits, puts you through trials and tests and wildernesses so that the rest of your life may be a lesser version of it. You'll be able to keep your smile when you're going to. And people look at you and say, how can you endure this? And you tell them, what? Endure what? This is nothing. 
we have seen wars. Do you understand? Yes, it's called military training. It stress you, put you in mud, so that when you go through other things, you can take it. In case it gets very tough, you can take it. You've been here before. She gave her one loaf, and Jesus multiplied it. For many people, your one loaf maybe that day, and I'm sure there are stories like that here. That day, should I, I mean, I could tell, Tochi, Tochi said, I used to invite her. I can't remember, I used to invite her. Nebia Tekong used to invite her. Come, she, they were roommates. I remember, yeah, when she came here, they used to come, tell Bonky, Bonky. You no, know, you know. So the girl used to invite her, come, let's go. And she would never go. And then one day we had a retreat. And the girl didn't invite her. Nebia did not invite her. She invited herself. And said, that thing, I'll come, I'll come, I'll come. And that's how she came. I remember her, she was crying when I was praying for her. Ah, she was crying. Then she fell down on the ground. She was crying and crying and crying. She was crying. I was wondering, I wonder what is wrong with this girl. You know? <laughs> but, and it was at Domita Farm. So she came all the way down there. Medical student, and we were in the middle of what? In the middle of exams, MBBS, semester exams. Okay, so, you know, um, I just heard this some weeks ago. She was in the middle of exams. This is years ago, but, you know, she was in, that was her one loaf. Are you understanding? Too many people, you never bring anything. Jesus, you've seen me, I'm here. I'm here, you said you should, should call on you, I call on you. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, so Jesus. bring something, bring something, something that means something. It's a loaf of bread. You could eat it up yourself, but you took it and gave to him. Every time you want to see the hand of God, give, bring. When I say give, it's not in the normal way people say, bring something. Bring something to the Lord. Give him something. Your time, your attention. Of focus, that she paid that price, left where she was, year four, three uh, medical students writing exams, and came down to that place and came looking for Jesus, whatever. That was something the Lord could look at and say, mm, okay. I know people that could stand holding their loaf of bread for 10 years. And nothing ever changes. You know, it's one of the things that scares me about God. How he can simply not move if you don't make a move. I have seen it. It, it terrifies me. I'm like, God, ah, you are serious. Sir? And it's like, yes, I am. If you don't do a little, I have sent you a message. I've pulled you. I've called your attention. I've sent people. Now take the step. You must take a step. The scriptures say, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. He sends reminders. If you will take a step towards him. You see, now this message, you know, a typical preacher would have been talking about money since. Have I mentioned money? It may be money for somebody, but that's one of a uh, hundred. Many times, God is not interested in money that much. But for some people, it can be a money situation. I know I have a habit of completely ignoring the money. Owned. And there's someone is listening. But I know there's someone listening and thinking, oh, he's talking about money. No, I am not. Money is one of our 1,000 things that God may say, give to me. It's just one. There may be that person who is going through something or financially or it's been, and you've always conserved and things have never been enough. And God is looking at you and he's saying, you know, for you, you have a money problem. You have a trust, a financial trust problem. Give me that thing. Now, let it be that that's what God told you. Don't, don't follow, don't, don't do the, see, because why I avoid the money part is because it's, it's been abused. Then you see people constantly trying to give God, take now, take, it's my last card. Take, 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 take. And things get harder and harder because he didn't ask you for it. You remember, he asked for it. It's Jesus that asked. How do we feed this crowd? Do you remember? 
So I'm not talking about things God is not asking for. That is only you that is interested in. Your own personal greed. No. I'm talking about things that God wants. God wants your heart. Give me your heart, my son. God wants your life. That's why I'm emphasizing that. Money is very second. Not, it's just far down the, the, the ladder. You know? But it can be a money situation for someone. God, God looks at someone and says, you always, you're too stingy for your good. Now, I'm going to test you. Give me that thing. So that can be someone's situation. But please, the Pentecostal preachers have preached it, abused it, torn it to pieces. Pick a piece of that in your mind. Use that one. Let me say the other side they don't say. Huh? A million people have said this one. Let me say this one. You, your life, your attention is the one loop. Bring it. He, God can, can stand like this and not move till you bring it. I've seen it. I'm telling you, we could say, tell many stories. So many times. Till you give that step. Till you give that obedience. Till you give that attention. Till you step out that day and actually say, ah, I will go out for evangelism. Ah, finally. And you step into the shop next to your family gate. You know, someone will think you are about to go to Mozambique for evangelism. <laughs> but you just step out of your house and saw someone start and say, excuse me, can I talk to you? And from that day, how many of you have experienced this? The grace came. The grace poured out. Before that, you kept well, one day. Months passed. This is what has happened to people in this congregation. Months and months passed. I will. When, the, when I feel one day I'm going to be standing, it will pour like fire. From my head, I'll feel it like a tingling. It will go down brrr, till there will be a transformation. And a clap of thunder. Boom. I'll emerge the evangelist. <laughs> you know, and all these things happen within our hearts. And it never happens. I'm going to say, eh? I'm, what I'm afraid of is God. God has, when I say mind, you just, this can go on for three years. Yes, know it and be afraid. Take it from me. You, you stand in that place. You can stand there for years. People stand there till they die. Yes, people stand in these places till they pass away. Till they go and meet their maker. And it's like, you don't move, I don't move. But the moment you say, I'll give you this little bit, I'll just talk to that girl across the street. After that, you go again. And then you find yourself, you know, one, it was Lydia there. I remember reading her, her you know, during the lockdown. And she said she went out. The first, was it your first time? She spoke to 18 people. Eight, was it 18 spots? 18, 18, first time, and she was alone, nobody with her, praying, and families were saying, please come back home, mothers were saying, these children, you, they'll be waiting for you, come back, and she'll walk on the street, and people will be saying, they have to, why have you not come now, why have you not come, she spoke to old, spoke to young, spoke to men, spoke to children, spoke to all sorts, with, with much trepidation, where she went out, the grace hit, that is how it works, that's your one loop, Lord, that's all I have, five loops, this is all I have, God doesn't mind how much you have. He minds whose hands they are in. Put them in my hands and that's all that matters. I am the multiplier. I am God who is all sufficient. You are not all sufficient. I know it. You are not all sufficient. No matter how you look, I know you are not. I know you are highly insufficient actually. If God is the all sufficient one, you are the highly insufficient one. I can see it. I know it from my own experience. Totally insufficient. I pity sufficient people. They don't go far with God. Those who go very far are the insufficient. And that's everyone. For all have sinned and fallen short. Fallen short. They are insufficient of the glory of God. You can't read the standard that pleases God. But take the little you have and give it to him. In obedience, watch him do wonders. Watch him walk miracles. People will look and say, look at that man. Look at what God, the mighty man of God. You tell them, no, I'm the man of a mighty God. I'm not the mighty man of God. I am the small man of a mighty God. That's all I am in your hands, in God's hands. 
God is able to do what He can do. Why? What do we? I, the, what am I therefore telling you? Teach people. Practice giving what you have to God. What do you have? Prayer. You can pray. God. How many of you? You know it. I know it's a common thing, but let's let me ask because we have new people here. You had this feeling. Ah, all these people that can pray for long hours. Wow. They have grace. God, people have grace. How many of you felt that? I have no grace to pray. None. I'm sure as I'm going to pray for two minutes, three minutes, and you knelt down. And when you got to one hour past two, you couldn't believe it. You couldn't understand what was happening. You looked at the time. You're like, eh? You didn't want to stand up. It's happened to you. How many of you have gone? You entered the place of prayer. Now, those of you that haven't experienced it, you experience it. Keep hanging out with God. You, you'll be angry that it's evening. Look at the time. It's six o'clock. You're like, ooh, Kai. And this place is so interesting. Kai. This place I'm reading. And you look at the clock. What is the clock, right? Meanwhile, there will be other times you look at the clock and wonder, is it right? <laughs> Let me explain for those that don't understand that. Those that understand are laughing. They understand. You know, you know, you prayed for at least 30 minutes. Then you looked at the clock and it's five minutes and you're like, you need to change the battery on this thing. I'm saying the day it will be, you think it's five up to 30 minutes and you look and it's three hours. It's coming. It happens. It happens to anyone. When the hand of God comes on you, the same place where there was no rain for three and a half years, there will be a deluge. A deluge will hit and you have to run faster than a horse to escape it. The day will come. The same thing that was so far away will be too near. You feel the presence of God and you're like, God, please don't come in here. I beg you. I will die you. Who has experienced this before? Raise your hand. It's not humility. Don't be silly. You felt the presence of God and you're like, you are afraid. You're like, God, I'd rather you, I'd rather we maintain a distant relationship. Yes? Yes. Now, how many of you used to wonder, can there ever be a day? Me, God, the same state or general, geographical, within a hundred, ten miles of where I am. How many of you used to wonder, God cannot come near me? Me, I am badness, just but human, cha. But if you had to look for a, 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 a synonym, I am bad. God cannot, God is close to people that are good. You see, similar hands that went up. How could it be? It can be because you gave him the little you had. That little boy couldn't have imagined that his bread would do anything. He couldn't. I'm just glad he didn't eat it. He couldn't have imagined. But that's all God needs. It's always what he needs. That's all. He said, oh, you gave me. No, you went out. You did what I wanted. You kept it for me. You gave it to me. Watch wonders. And he begins to form out of nothing. It's what the creator does. He's the creator. Not you are not. He is. He's the creator. Hear this. Believe it. Practice it in all things. Whenever he tells me give me something, give it. Unfortunately, sometimes when he collects it, he doesn't multiply it immediately. Some he puts it in the ground. Corn of wheat. John 12. And it dies. And people tell you, where is that thing? I bet I told you. I bet I told you. Now you've lost out completely. Look at you. Look at your life. That happens. This is the part people don't like. This is the part where he starts saying, God, did I miss it? God, what? God, I taught you. God, 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 God. It's called faith. Sometimes he doesn't multiply immediately. He puts it in the ground like a seed. And then you wait. Time passes. And then... One month later, one year later, three years later, five years later, something emerges. I love your family, Kai. You're so lucky, Kai. Such a happy home. Oh, if you know the envy, I envy you. Oh, God. It's sweet to tell the story. Were you there when he or she was waiting? When the marriage was at hand and God said, no, that's not me. Step away from there. Step away. And the person was willing to bury their marriage plans. Bury their vision of when they will settle down. They were willing. When they buried it because God asked, were you there? You were not there. 
Or you may have been amongst those that said, see, you're very, you're not a wise person. Opportunity comes but once. The book of... <laughs> you don't know that verse? <laughs> it's not in the Bible. Opportunity comes but once. Huh? <laughs> the book of Onesimus, chapter 1, <laughs> verse 3. If you check verse 3, verse 3, 4, for context, for TT comes by once. What nonsense. I don't know why people say things like that. <laughs> Isn't that, don't you know, but TT does not come by once. Why do you tell lies like that? Someone that's a TT comes by once. People say it's true. Really? You had one chance to write jam. You had one chance. Come, don't. Even if you want to lie, look for something that looks real. Can't be telling bad lies, you know. So, gee, God doesn't say that. And people will try to make you feel bad every time you obey God. Sometimes. But if you ignore them and say, well, I did. He asked me for my bread. One of his apostles, his disciples asked me. A servant, God, they asked me. Now, I know there are people that God didn't send them. And they come and take your loaf. So you're finished. The hunger will wire you. <laughs> Now, this is the truth. There are, there are people that God did not send, false apostles that come to you. Say, my name is Philip. Do you have bread? Come, give it to me. The Lord has need of this your car. The Lord has need of your salary. The Lord has need. How you know God did not send them is the hunger that follows thereafter. The difficulty that seems to not change. The trouble. Do you know him before? Who does he follow? Do you see him carry Tanga and give the Lord? Track him. Watch. Where did he take you to? If he didn't seem handed over to the Lord, call it, give him back. <laughs> this thing my mother gave me was not for, 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 for anybody and everybody. I don't want to faint as I'm going back. So there are people that have been deceived by false apostles, like the book of uh, uh, Revelation chapter 2. People, they came and make, make demands. They come and make demands that God didn't send. God didn't send them. Oh, just bring 250,000 and bring this and bring that and and you foolish that's what happens when you don't know god personally you're very easily deceived and they take things from you the little you didn't even have people even go and borrow suffer at the hands of charlatans and schemers dishonest people i'm not saying don't ever give your one loaf to such a person ever you'll be hungry but if it's the lord that you gave it to if it's truly the lord that led you he will multiply. Even if time passes, it's going to multiply. You look and see the fruit and you go, wow. Look at what came from that one decision. Look at that decision. I gave up this job and took the other job. Or I gave up this opportunity and waited for this. Or I gave up this chance because God asked me to. Look at what was birthed from it. Look at this mighty mustard tree with branches sticking far and wide. Providing a shade for the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. How did I come to be this useful and such a blessing to people? Because of who you gave the seed to. That's how. It has nothing to do with you. You can use your energy and do all sorts of things. I'm not talking about people that use marketing skills and slick moves and hype. No, you can do all sorts of stunts to achieve things. Non-Christians build things from scratch too. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the will of God. I'm talking about doing God's will. If you do it, you won't strive in human strength. In our congregation here, we put up that sign po po post, uh, just God's lighthouse, so people can know where to find us. The first time, for the first time since 2010, when I first had a church meeting, when God first told me in, in, in June, 2010. That's the first time we're having a sign post. A sign saying anything. That's the first time. That's one month ago or so. July 1 uh, and 26, June 26 or something. So about a month ago. Yes. That's the this is the first time ever we had a sign, a signboard. Saying, this is where we are. Even when we had a whole sign post sitting down, we just had to put a flex over it with a picture. We never did it. 
And also all those people, if you came to the warehouse, you saw those people. We never had a sign. People would come. My parlor from my from before, you know, the first phase of, you know, and at any time, I wouldn't do anything. It's not wrong to. I'm just saying that I went out of my way to try not to attract anything in the flesh because too many people do things in the flesh. We do things in the flesh. People do things in the flesh so much and then they say we give glory to God. And God is saying, I have no hand in that thing. You try too much in the flesh. This is you. I was once in charge of business development for a firm. So I know you, you can exert yourself, put in energy, try, make an effort, stress yourself, go far and wide, visit, talk, spend hours, spend money, invest into marketing. The top companies of the world are said to use up to 20%. Coca-Cola, all these guys. That's why they, are, they always have adverts. So massive, a whole stadium full of people. You think all those people are actors. They pay them. They get a musician, come and sing. She stands there. Ah! Dun, 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 dun. And they spend millions. For what? Who does not know Coca-Cola? Why do they keep creating the adverts? Why do they go to every Olympics? <laughs> it's called Survivor. So they make noise. Unfortunately, I think it's a fleshly tactic. It's understood in the earth realm. What about the spirit realm? Now, God can bless a, his, a person's business, even with spiritual favor, okay? Attract people, give them favor. If the people of this world go to sorcerers to get power, to attract business, then there's a supernatural dimension to all things. But I don't think you should use natural methods for the church of God. I think you have to do what God says. I think so. Anyways. Let me finish this reading. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Watch out, he cautioned them. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. The leaven of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. I won't go into reading all of it. It's there. It's written directly in another passage where Jesus says hypocrisy. The leaven of Herod is politics. There's a message on this. Please ask. Get it and listen to it. I talked about the three kinds of living the Bible talks about. There's the living of malice and wickedness. The living of Herod. I'm using where the word living was used directly. Living is yeast. What makes bread rise and be a different size from reality. That thing that puffs the bread up. That's yeast, living. All right, so God does not like. That's why in the Feast of Passover, he would tell them to bake the bread without leaven. Reality. What leaven does is that it changes reality. Yeast changes reality. It makes things look different from how they really are. It makes things look bigger than they really are. Pharisees are masters of, they're hypocrites. Hypocrites make things look different from how it is. Is this clear? Mm -hmm. So hypocrisy is the yeast of Pharisees. Pretends. Putting on an appearance, looking more than God has allowed you to be, being puffed up. You can do it with knowledge. You can do it by listening to many people that say high sounding things. Then you copy them and talk like them. And it's not backed up with actual knowledge and experience. It's not backed up by depth. It just looks big. Do you get the living of Herod is politics. The Herodians being stirred up. By side, a party spirit. That's where you choose sides. Sectarianism. I'm on this side. I'm on that side. You like being on sides of things. You like choosing a side. It's like living. It goes into your nature. It makes you... So you're, you're talking about all sorts of things with high sounding words and all that. It seems very attractive. Many people enjoy the living of Herod. They don't know. They play politics. They are Christians. But you go into endless... Scheming, 
Those are the traits of poli- political maneuvering, scheming, deception. There's all of that. When they told Jesus, ah, Herod is looking for you, he said, go tell that fox. What's a fox? What's the picture of a fox? A deceitful, cunning, slinking creature that looks around. And when there's nobody, digs under into the hen house and steals eggs and chickens. That's the nature of a fox. It's sly. That's the nature of politicians. They are sly. They are suave. They they deceive. They trick. They pretend to care. Okay? God doesn't like it. You want to tell her reality? Tell her reality. Sorry, I need to point out to you that the way you spoke to that person isn't right. You understand? Say, let's welcome a, an orator. I mean, this this is a woman of words. Let's welcome. To, you don't do all, for what you want. You want her votes. You want her support. You, this is what politicians do. Do Christians do this? Huh? Swaying people by saying things they want to hear? The living of Herod. It's very... So Jesus tells those who follow him, and he says, beware of it. Don't do it. So if you're out there and you're a child of God, like there's a series on it, please get it and hear it, probably from 2018 or 19. So they began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. Aware of their conversation, Jesus asked them, why are you debating about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Do you have such hard hearts? So you see, this is the issue. Hardened, a hardened heart. (laughs) Verse 17. Mark 8, verse 17. Is your heart hardened? Okay, said there. Is your heart hardened? If you look at Mark 6, verse 52, it says, For they had not understood about the loaves, but their hearts had been hardened. Says it directly. Says their hearts had been hardened. Hardness of heart is connected to an inability to see. Matthew 13, verse 15. Matthew 13, verse 15 says, For this people's heart has grown callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Do you see what happens to a hardened heart? A hard heart does not allow you to see, hear, or understand. You hear that prayer I'm always praying? Eyes to see, ears to hear, heart to understand. It's a prayer that God free you from a hard heart. Why? When you are healed from a hard hard heart, the Bible says you will turn and he will heal you. Do people want the healing touch of God? Oh, people are praying and looking for the healing touch of God everywhere. But they don't know how to get it. They need to be free of a hard heart. And healing will come to your family, to your life, to your circumstances. God's healing touch will come if you will be free of a hard heart. And that will be shown in the ability to see, hear, and understand. Seeing, hearing, and understanding is the key to being delivered from a hard heart. I was reading Mark 8 to you. Let me finish. Jesus said, do you have such hard hearts? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of broken pieces did you collect? Twelve, they answered. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of broken pieces did you collect? Seven, they said. 
Then he asked them, do you still not understand? Can you see Jesus? Jesus is at a, in a quandary. He's, 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 he's weak. Like, why don't you understand? How, who knows from what we've read, how to understand? Pay attention to what has happened in the past. Is that clear? Do you agree? He tells them based on what you have seen before. So one of the ways you know a person whose heart is soft. One of the ways you know a person whose eyes have been opened is that when they talk, when they think, when they make decisions, you hear them make reference to the things that have been. There's a song. I think it's Don Man. I found out that sang it. You know, I was looking for I, it came to my mind the other day. I was singing. And uh, an old song from the 70s. God can do it again and again and again. He's the same God today as he always has been. Yesterday and today and forever the same. There's no reason to doubt. God can do it again. You see, he's the same. He's the same. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So one of the signs of someone with a heart that is functional, that doesn't have a hard heart, think, see. He, what God refers to as having eyes to see and ears to hear is the ability to connect the dots. What happened with so and so? What happened the other time? What happened in the story you read in the Bible? In that message you heard? In that Christian book you read? What did you read about God? The one who holds on to all these things and refers to them is the one with a soft heart. Is the one with an understanding heart. The one who ignores the evidence, the testimonies, the stories of others, the situations they had, the things they were involved in themselves. Oh, I remember when I had my first child, God did this. Yes, I know. I've seen God's power. Bets. 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 They are the ones that use bets a lot. And you wonder, sir, why don't you um, so, so and so? And they said, see, uh, young man, I can tell you many such experiences. And by the time they finish talking, you're wondering, so you, you, so you know. Uh -huh. Therefore, and they go, that does not mean that God they constantly disqualify the things God has said and done in the past. They have the stories, but they refuse to continue to walk in it. That is a sign of a person with a hardened heart. It doesn't allow you to understand the point. You just have acts. You can tell stories of the mighty acts of God, but you have no understanding of the reason for the acts. Oh, yes, God opened the Red Sea. Uh, uh, we, I was there. I was there. I was there. We looked up like this in the morning. The ground was dry. It was a sea there that night before. My son, pay attention. I was there. I was there. Don't ever, don't insult me. I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. At that time, I was 25 years old. We were burning. After that, Miriam. Let the ladies. That's when they released that song. About how God is the greatest God. is the only God. Yes. We were the choir. We saw the bread drop the first time it dropped. We saw the water from the rock. We saw it. Again, I said, with my eyes, I saw it. This is the reality. This is the reality. This is my experience. This is what I have seen and known. This is what I have enjoyed. Is this clear? Okay. The only problem I am saying, I'm not saying I've not seen God do something. The only problem is this, that this thing, you heard the 10 men say they are giants in that land. Big things like this. That is what we are discussing. Leave the past. Maybe not the giants, I mean. <laughs> What will we do about these giants? 
And you're wondering, I don't understand. May, may you not have the misfortune of being in a discussion with anybody like this because I have had. You wonder, of what use is all this thing you're saying when none of it is used to apply to any decision in the present? He is not the difference yesterday, almost today, possibly tomorrow. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same. He's unchanging. Is this clear? He is unchanging. God doesn't change. Therefore, anything or anyone that makes God look like he's changing, that person has a hardened heart. The children of Israel had this terrible affliction. Every single time there was a new circumstance, they grumbled, they complained, they challenged Moses, they challenged Aaron's leadership every single time. What a thing. Every single time. They refused to use the past as a reference point for anything. They lived in the present only. May nobody hearing me remain under such an affliction. Because this is how to perish during the journey. How not to make it 101. Have no regard for past experiences. Have no regard for past encounters. Ignore completely past interventions from the Most High God. Keep ignoring it. You will die in the wilderness like the children of Israel. That's what he said in Hebrews 3. He said, today, don't harden your heart like they did. Why? Because you can. You can harden your heart. You can harden your heart. You can have all the experiences and end up like one who had no experience. Jesus, uh, uh, sorry, Peter said, he said that they have gone back to their vomit. Second Peter 2. He said they are like dogs that have gone back to their vomit. And he said it is better they had not known the way of salvation. It's better they didn't know. It's not neutral. It is not neutral when you step out and end up the same way like someone who never knew. It's not neutral. It's better you didn't know. Why did you know and then lose it? Why did you start and not arrive when you could arrive? Okay? So, that's all I want to say about what Jesus said there. Jesus wants us to understand. He wants you to use your experience. Do not be like all those people that take all the experiences and throw them away or lock them up in a safe and ignore them. Keep them for constant reference. You want to be hot forever. You want to maintain how it was when you got to know God newly. Constant reference to the things God has said and done. One generation ought to tell another generation the mighty deeds of God. Not for fun, but so that it stays fresh. So they know that their God is a living God. His name was Gideon. He says, you know, when he greets him, thou mighty man of valor, he says, wow, look at why are we not seeing the same thing? He said, go in this, your might. In other words, you know what I did before? You've heard of what I did before? Aha! Now go in that might. Go with that knowledge. Go with that assurance that that God is still alive. And that's how God was able to use Gideon, one of the first clearly named judges, and brought great change and deliverance for the people of Israel. Because there was someone that paid attention it's why I tell stories of past moves of God and past dealings of God from years past, hundreds, thousands of years, recent times, happening in other parts of the world, happening with anybody, happening in our own congregation. Because when you hear it, it's supposed to soften your heart to know that this our God is the same God. This our God is capable. This our God is able. Is this okay? Yes. 